Well, with that this morning, we come to a second requested sermon. Last week, we discussed the topic of the Trinity. And if you remember the definition, how many of you remember the definition? The definition is very specific and very intentional. It is God is one in essence, three in persons. And we talked about that quite a bit last week. You can uh, get that sermon. It's on our website if you missed it. Uh, But this week we come to another requested topic, which is also vitally important to the health of the church and also important as we face the new year in 2021. And it is the topic of marriage, and specifically, the glory of God seen in the face of marriage. Unfortunately, the whole idea of marriage has fallen under hard times in our modern culture, and so it seems important that uh, we would address this in the church this morning, and with that, we should probably pray again, if you would pray with me this morning. Father, once again, we come to you and we uh, seek your face, we seek your guidance. And God, I'm reminded of the words of your son, Jesus, who told his disciples, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Father, we understand that this rock that Jesus was referring to is the confession of our faith that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And upon that confession of faith, we understand that the church is in offense. We're not in defense. We're in offense, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So for the next few minutes, Lord, I ask and I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit and the truth of your word, Lord, that you would allow me to be on the offensive Rescuing hearts and souls that are maybe even at the very threshold of the gates of hell. That you would allow me, Father, to pluck brands out of the fire and preserve them for your glory and the truth of the gospel. And especially in the context of marriage. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we launch onto the waters of the great topic of, of uh, I can't even find where I'm supposed to be, that's not a good sign. As we launch into the waters of this great topic of marriage, uh, it seems right that we begin with two points of clarification, and uh, these two points of clarification specifically are one, the special gift of celibacy or singleness that goes with that. And two, that gay marriage is not biblical marriage, okay? These two points um, need to be clarified before we can move forward. That is not the, the uh, tone of my message. I don't want that to be the focus or the thrust of my, of my message, but we need to address those two points of clarification first and hopefully briefly. So let's take them each separately and I'll explain to you what I mean by each. First of all, celibacy is a special gift. Regarding marriage, it must be understood that not everyone is called to it. Though I certainly believe that the majority of adults are called to the relational covenant of marriage between one man and one woman for the glory of God, It must also be recognized, as Scripture recognizes, that there are a special minority of people who are called to a life of singleness and celibacy for the glory of God. This can happen uh, through those whom the Lord has specifically set apart and have made it their lifelong status. Or it can also happen through those who have experienced the tragedy of the death of a spouse and now find themselves in a life of singleness. Or it could happen in those who are yet waiting for a spouse for the right person to come along. So singleness and celibacy can happen a few different ways. And I want to just point out that as it can be imagined, the world can take this concept and seriously paint a very negative picture about it. 
But we must always filter our thinking through the lens of Scripture. And when we submit to this process, we find that God's Word speaks of the celibate life as a very special gift given to a very special and select few. Here's what Scripture says. 1 Corinthians 7, 7 through 9. Paul speaking says, Yet I wish that all men were even as I am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, then let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion." So Paul first establishes this argument that it is his wish for people to be like him in regards to marriage. It's his wish, right? This isn't a command, this is a wish. And what exactly does he mean by this? He's talking about being single. He's talking about being unmarried. As far as we know, Scripture and from history books... Uh, Paul was never married. He was single. And therefore, he is expressing in these verses that his wish, not a command, his wish is for unmarried people to remain unmarried like him. And we look at this and we think, well, why in the world would Paul say that? What in the world is he trying to get at? What is the point of him making this desire of his known? And the argument that he gives for his statement is found a few verses later in verses 32 through 35 of 1 Corinthians 7, whereby he says this, I want you to be free from concern. What does he mean by that? He goes on to explain. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And therefore, his interests are divided. Get a picture, two different types of people. The woman who is unmarried, he goes on to explain further, and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And then he says, makes this statement, this principal statement, this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. So he makes, his, he makes his argument saying that those who are unmarried have this special opportunity to focus all their efforts on pleasing the Lord. Whereas those who are married find themselves in a position where, yes, they are still devoted to the Lord, but yet their attention and their energies and their resources are divided because they also have a spouse and a family to care for, which is a good thing, right? He's not saying it's a bad thing, but it's just a reality. A married person's interests are going to be divided, and therefore the temptation is, is that the things of the world would become a distraction from the things of God. So therefore, back to verse 8, this is why Paul says, to the unmarried and to widows, I say that it is good for them if they remain as they are, single, even as Paul was. But, at the same time, he recognizes that singleness is a special gift, and not all people have it, nor should all people pursue it. Verse 9, but, he says, if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So we see that while the majority of people are called to the covenant of marriage, there are a select few who, whether by circumstances of this world or by, by the calling of the Lord, have made themselves and find themselves to be single. And Paul points out this is a special gift of the Lord, and it is marked by the fruit of self-control. An example for further clarification would be the prophetess Anna in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse 36 through 37. It says, and there was a prophetess, 
Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. And she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. So we have the example of Anna who was married for seven years and then finds herself that her spouse passes away and she becomes a widow. And so she spends the next remaining years of her life, which are probably quite a few, praying and serving the Lord in the temple and fasting as well. We've got to throw that in there. So, clarification number one. As we talk about marriage today, I feel it necessary to point out that celibacy is a special gift. And those called to it should recognize it is not a thing to be despised, but rather understood as God's special calling given to a very select few. I find that there is condemnation that um, is often permeates the life of those who are single and that the world and the enemy uses it against them. So I want to use this first point of clarification as a segue as we move into marriage to understand that you are not being condemned, but rather you need to understand you occupy a very special place in the kingdom of God for however long that may be. Okay, that one was a little bit longer. The next clarification is more brief, more to the point, mostly because I believe it is the most obvious, or at least it should be for Bible-minded people. And this clarification is this, that gay marriage is not biblical marriage. Here's what I mean. The union of two people of the same gender, either man and man or woman and woman, may be something which state and federal governments recognize and even bestow with the title of marriage, but it needs to be recognized that according to the timeless parameters and the authority of Scripture, that it is not the same thing. The laws of Scripture, and we could very easily add the laws, the natural laws of creation, point out that marriage is between one man and one woman. For example, in the Old Testament, God said this in Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, this is God speaking. I want to be clear on that. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The words here used in Hebrew is the word ish for man and isha for woman. Because woman came out of man, ish and isha. Not ish and ish, not isha and isha. Or we could turn to the New Testament whereby the Lord Jesus Christ himself affirmed this by quoting the Old Testament saying in Matthew 19 verses 3 through 5, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The gender qualification for biblical marriage are very clear. They are without confusion. If one is willing, I guess, to accept the plain text of Scripture. So furthermore, While God does give his abundant blessings on the union of man and woman within the covenant of marriage, nowhere in the pages of the Bible does God give the same blessing to the union of male and male or female and female. Therefore, as I said, even though governments may bestow on these relationships the legal title of marriage along with the civil and social rights a government can give, At the same time, God's word does not bless it, nor does it recognize it as legitimate. In fact, not only does scripture not recognize it as legitimate, but it actually condemns these types of relationships with the most serious of language. A couple of examples. Leviticus 18.22 
You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Abomination is a thing which causes deep disgrace. Some synonyms are atrocity or horror. It is a thing which incurs God's hatred. This is very, very strong language. Abomination. Or one from the New Testament, Romans chapter 1. Paul speaking says, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. Why? Why did God give them over to degrading passions? For this reason, their women had exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Scripture is clear over and over and over again in that the Lord condemns this. And we need to recognize that it is not the same thing as biblical marriage, though government might say it is. And also, I don't want to leave it hanging there, right? Because it also needs to be said very quickly, right? After we condemn this, right? Or after Scripture condemns this, right? This isn't Pastor Chad. This is Scripture. I hope you see that. It also needs to be very quickly said that Scripture also provides the abundant opportunity for repentance and forgiveness and to be washed in the blood of the Lamb and to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I was going to go into 1 Corinthians 6, but we have other things to say about marriage this morning, and I don't want this to be the tone of the message. So those are my two points of clarification. With that, Let's engage Scripture further, whereby I will present to you, this is also on your outline in your bulletin, first of all, the biblical roots and the vision of marriage, secondly, the quality of love in marriage, and thirdly, I will conclude this morning, Lord willing, with one single plea for the preservation of your marriage. So let's begin with marriage, its roots and vision. In its roots, we find that marriage is one into two and two into one. And no, this is not another sermon about the Trinity. Let me explain. The creation story is really an incredible story on so many different levels. It's, you know, when I, when I just uh, am maybe bored, you know, you just kind of get into a rut and you just kind of like, ah, I'm just kind of bored with this or bored with that. And I go to the creation story and it just like, it is so interesting and just so amazing, the creation of God, right? I mean, the first two chapters of Genesis are just, just incredible to me. But for the sake of our message this morning, we will focus in on the creation of man and woman, along with it, the roots for marriage. If one wants to discover where marriage came from in the first place, one must go to the very beginning, even to the very day, the sixth day when God created mankind. And it says this in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over, all, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And what we find in this passage is that on the sixth day, God created man in his image And furthermore, he created them distinctly as male and female. And it's we can take this and make this statement, from one came two. But the interesting thing is that this one who becomes two, male and female, then becomes one again through the union of marriage. It's an amazing thing. Genesis 2.22 
The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And here it is. And they shall become one flesh. One into two and two back into one through the covenant of marriage. This is a great mystery and a great marvel of God's creation that in his image he chose to create man represented as two, male and female, and then called these two to become one through the covenant of marriage. Isn't that amazing? Why would anybody want to mess with that? Rhetorical question. Within this great wonder, we find that God has a very specific purpose and vision for this union. And uh, this vision is repeated many times throughout Scripture. And it's seen in this phrase, be fruitful and multiply. God's vision for mankind was this, through marriage, be fruitful and multiply. We see it stated at creation in Genesis 1.28, to repeat that verse again, whereby it says God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Or we see it again after the flood of Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1, and then again in 7, whereby God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then verse 7, very similar. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. And again, we see this repeated at the calling of Jacob in Genesis chapter 35, verses 9 through 11. It says that then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And thus he called him Israel. And God also said to him, I am God Almighty, therefore be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall go forth from you. And we see it again within the context of the New Testament outlined by Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 23 says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself, God says, will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and here it is. And they will be fruitful and multiply. And Jeremiah goes on to outline the covenant of David, that a righteous branch shall be raised up, referring to the Messiah uh, of the lineage of David, that within this whole context is the new covenant, that within the new covenant we shall be fruitful and multiply. So we find from creation to the covenant of Noah, to the calling of Jacob, to the covenant of the new covenant, the calling is the same, that for married people we are to be fruitful and multiply. And that takes on many different dimensions, not just merely bearing offspring. But this is not the only calling or vision or purpose which God attaches to the relationship of Marriage, it is also for the purpose of help. And how many of you realize we need help in this life, right? We need abundant help sometimes. Therefore, one of the ways which God has provided it to us is through biblical marriage. And so we turn back to the beginning again in order to see this. Genesis 2.18 Then the Lord God said, as He was observing Adam and all of creation... It is not good for the man to be alone, therefore I will make him a helper suitable for him. And the following verses describe Eve. 
So now it must be mentioned that God's vision of help given through marriage is not one-sided, though. Right? We can look at this and we think, well, Adam needed help, but women don't. Men need help, but women, now may, men may need more help than women, <laughs> you know, but, but we need to be careful and not misunderstand what this is saying. Or we could misunderstand it in the sense that the only purpose of woman is to be man's helper. Both of those conclusions would be wrong and would lead to a very unhealthy relationship. Instead, we must include the whole counsel of God's word and uh, turn to such passages as 1 Corinthians 11, 11. Paul says, however, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman, right? We need each other. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. And the point that Paul is making here, which balances out what we just saw in, uh, in Genesis, is that we need each other, and it is expressed here in a very fundamental way in Corinthians. Woman originated from man, Adam and Eve, and man has his birth from the woman. Therefore, we are not independent of each other. We need each other, and we also need to understand that we fall under this umbrella that we have both come from God, that we've both been created by God in his image. So just a, another point of clarification. So therefore, moving beyond this fundamental expression of help, that our very existence is dependent upon each other, the help which comes from the relationship of a strong biblical marriage takes on at least three other forms. And this could be a sermon in and of itself, but I just want to give these to you briefly because I think they're important um, as we're building towards the conclusion. First of all, within marriage, our help comes in the form of preserving moral integrity. One of the helps which comes from the marriage relationship is that it provides the way of escape from adultery and immorality. And we've already discussed this briefly in the clarification regarding celibacy, but for reference, same verse, 1 Corinthians 7, 9. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Right? Is there a temptation to adultery in your single life? Then get married, because it's better to be married than to burn with passion and fall into sin. So we find that marriage helps us in the sense of preserving our moral integrity. Second of all, it helps us to raise godly children. And this we have also discussed briefly and would most likely fall under the mandate of be fruitful and multiply. But again, for reference, Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. One of the benefits of a godly marriage is that we raise up godly children to the glory of God, fulfilling the mandate of being fruitful and multiplying and populating the earth. And thirdly, as I said, these are brief, to produce spiritual maturity. And I've thought long and hard about this in my own, my own marriage and uh, possibly one of the greatest tools in the toolbox of the Holy Spirit for the work of sanctification is that of marriage. I'm not sure that God has a more effective tool in the life of married people than the covenant of marriage. And furthermore, we could even go so far as to say that it is one of the most effective tools in an unequally yoked marriage whereby one spouse is a believer and the other isn't. Here's what I mean by that as we consider 1 Corinthians again, uh, this time chapter 7, verse 12. Paul says, To the rest I say, not the Lord, but me, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away, right? So Paul is saying, look, if, if, uh, if, we, if there's a brother in the Lord in the church and he has an unbelieving wife, he must not divorce her because she's not a believer. 
or the other way around. If the wife is a believer and the husband is not, she must not send him away just because he is not a follower of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified, set apart through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified, set apart through her, unbelie- or through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy, set apart as well. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, for God has called us to peace. And then he throws out some rhetorical questions at the very end, verse 16. For how do you know, O believing wife, whether you will save your husband or not? Or how do you know, O believing husband, whether you will be the means by which your unbelieving wife is saved? So we find that within the context of marriage, that it is quite possibly, it could be argued very strongly, that it is one of the most effective tools in the hands of the Holy Spirit by which people are sanctified, even possibly by which an unbelieving spouse could become a believing spouse. Therefore, don't give up. And Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 says the exact same thing. This is not only uh, Paul's thinking. This is Peter's thinking as well. Okay. So with that, hopefully we've seen uh, the roots very quickly of biblical marriage within the creation story as well as its vision for what it's for, what its purposes are. It's important that we remember that, right? It's important that we remind ourselves. What, what does the Bible say? What, how important is, is marriage? Why, why should we cling to what the Bible says marriage is? Well, it's important because we understand the purpose behind it. So next we want to take this a step further and establish or maybe reestablish one of the primary qualities of marriage, which is love. In all of our relationships, we must recognize that love is essential, right? I mean, it's the second greatest commandment, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love is a primary quality in the life of Christians um, in all areas. For example, Corinthians says this, 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, right? So you can speak with angelic voices. You can speak with tongues, Holy Spirit tongues. But if you don't have love, then you've become nothing but a clanging cymbal, a noisy gong. Or if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but if I don't have love... I'm absolutely nothing. Or a third time, Paul says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, very noble things should be sought after. And if I surrender my body to be burned as a martyr, but don't have love, it profits profits me absolutely nothing. So we find that the quality of love is a very high quality. It should not be overlooked. It should be pursued in all of our relationships, but especially in the relationship of marriage. And so for this, we go to the Song of Solomon this morning. The Song of Solomon says this about love in chapter 8, verses 6 through 7, saying, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, For love is as strong as death, jealousy as severe as Sheol, which is a reference to the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord, and many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised, and hopefully you can get a sense of what they're saying in here, about how important, about how special the quality of love is. It's described here as being as strong as death. Its jealous passion is as severe as the grave. 
it possesses flashes of fire similar to the flame of the Lord, which is a reference oftentimes in the Old Testament of lightning. And furthermore, it cannot be quenched by many waters, nor can it be flooded uh, through flooded rivers. They cannot overflow it nor wipe it out. And if a man were to sell all of his possessions, all of the riches of his household, sell all of his property in order to buy love, all of that wealth would fall miserably short. And in this description, I don't want you to miss the context in which it is being spoken, which is the context of the whole Song of Solomon book. This is the dialogue between a man and a woman who are seriously committed to their covenant relationship of marriage and are deeply in love with each other. Their unbreakable love invades every thought and every action, and they are hopelessly lost within its grip. Right? This is the picture of a couple that is deeply in love, and they are an absolute mess. And while most of us who are married in this place can identify with what is going on in these verses having most likely personally experienced these emotions of young love, at the same time, regrettably, possibly we can also recognize that this may not be the case any longer. We once had the fire, we once had the passion, we once had the exciting romance of a godly marriage, but somehow the cares, the distractions of the world... The burden of our sinful nature has somehow diminished the flame of the fire of love. It's still there probably, but I'm not sure if it's putting out any more, any heat anymore. And so if that maybe describes you this morning, or for those of you watching at home this morning, let me draw your attention as we close to one single plea of preservation and encouragement. Jesus said this, in your life you will have trouble. He didn't say maybe, possibly. He says in this world, in this life, you will have trouble or tribulation, depending on your translation. But take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And this is no less true in our marriage relationships. In your marriage, Jesus could have very well said, you're going to have trouble. You're in the world, you're going to have trouble. You're two selfish creatures, you're two sinful creatures. There's going to be troubles. So many couples start out strong with with these great dreams and plans for life, but along the way, the troubles of this world begin to choke out the intensity and and the dreams start to die away. Find themselves with the weight of temptation and sin, which threatens to bury the vitality of their covenant life. They allow small areas of unforgiveness to come into their lives and fester, and and these give rise to great wounds of relational chasm and distance and separation. There's roots of bitterness that take place in hearts, threatening to quench this fiery flame of love. And the next thing you know, couples begin thinking that separation and divorce is a good thing. We just want to give up. Instead of fixing the problem, instead of restoring the passionate flame of love, it just seems easier to give up and walk away. And as a result, the devil is given another feather in his hat. But let me encourage you, as we conclude, back to our couple in the Song of Solomon. They recognized the reality of this potential threat, I believe. And here is how they addressed it. Song of Solomon Chapter 2, verse 15. This is important. You should have this underlined in your Bible, especially if you're married. Says this Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. 
Let me give you the context. Let me paint a picture for you. The picture is this. In the verses before chapter or verse 15, we find a description given of a very lush, vibrant vineyard. It says that the winter season has passed, the spring rains have ended, and as a result, the flowers have appeared in full blossom. The figs of the fig trees are ripe and ready to be eaten. It says the blossoms on the vine are full of their fragrant smell. And it even says the turtle doves are cooing throughout the land. You get a picture of this vineyard, right? Lush, beautiful, at the prime of its life. But there's just one problem. As it says in verse 15, little foxes have shown up in the vineyard. These nasty little beasts. And they're ruining the vineyard. They're destroying things. They're wrecking the flowers. They're digging up the vines. They're chasing away the turtle doves. They're threatening to ruin this place of beauty and tranquility. And if you haven't guessed it yet, this is all an allegorical picture symbolizing the love between a man and a woman. Their love is like this vibrant vineyard. But unfortunately, little foxes have come in and are trying to wreck the vineyard. How does this happen? I think maybe one of the biggest ones is through unforgiveness. Unforgiveness wrecks intimacy. It happens through roots of bitterness being allowed to crop up, whereby it undermines commitment. It happens through broken hearts that have been let down and therefore trust is destroyed because it's never forgiven. And so what's the answer? The bride calls out to the bridegroom with all seriousness, catch these nasty little foxes and get rid of them before they wreck our vineyard. What's that look like for us? Husbands, load your rifle because we are going hunting for fox. Wives, prepare the oven because we're having fox stew. We're not going to allow these foxes into our vineyard. How dare you try to disrupt our vineyard of love? How dare you try to tempt us away from our covenant? How dare you try to invade the faithfulness of our marriage, which God has called us to? Foxes be prepared to be driven out in the name of Christ. That's what that verse means. And let me take it a step further, just in a very practical way, as I continue to close. <laughs> if you don't know exactly how to do this, right? Maybe you, maybe you look around and you think, yeah, that's us. There's foxes in our vineyard and they're just wrecking everything and I don't know how to get rid of them. Let me give you very one practical, loving piece of advice and it's this. Seek out the counsel of those who have gone before you. What I mean is this, in our church, God has blessed us with a generation of people who have been there and done that and are still walking in covenant marriage after many, many years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, and they're still doing it. Seek them out. They didn't get there by accident. No doubt there were foxes along the way that tried to invade the vineyard. But they established certain things in their lives, certain principles by which the foxes are not allowed to get in. So I would encourage you this morning, use the wise and experienced resources God has given to this church. Seek them out. Ask them how they persevered over the years. Ask them to pray for you. Ask them to disciple you. I assure you they would love to do that. And in so doing, drive out the little foxes that may have entered your vineyard. Let me just remind you, God has planted your vineyard. Don't allow so easily the weeds to grow up in it. Amen? This morning, worship team... is. 
you would come this morning as we turn towards communion. We prepare our hearts as we turn to the God who is able to work wonders, who is able to soften hardened hearts, make them moldable, make them impressionable, in order to be a forgiving type of heart. Now, I don't know about you, but forgiveness can sometimes be one of the most difficult things in our lives, and especially in the context of, of the intimacy of a marriage. How in the world could they do that? We're so close. We're supposed to be so close. And maybe for you, unforgiveness is a difficult thing in your life. I would encourage you that the answer is Christ. And so in these next few moments as we pursue communion, would you take a moment and ask the Lord to soften your hearts? If there be unforgiveness in your life, especially in your marriage, maybe it would be at this point in time that God would heal you. Father, we thank you so much for your grace in our lives. God, we thank you so much for the instruction of your word in our lives. And God, we confess that we are often very weak and foolish people who need your help abundantly. And so, Father, I pray in these next few moments as we examine our lives, including, including our marriages, Father, that we would confess anything that is sinful, that we would turn to you for our healing and receive it in abundance. In Jesus' name.